Hi, this is Jason Ma of the St. Louis Cardinals, and I gotta have my ICTV. Hello, and welcome to Inside Iona. I'm Kyle Byrne. And I'm Chrissy Bookie. It's great to be back with you. I know, I missed you last week, but Maral did a great job. She did. It was fun to switch things up and do entertainment with Kelvin, but I'm happy to be back with you in the studio. Now let's take a look at what's happening inside Iona. Iona's very own political science professor is appearing on camera for Al Jazeera America. The Iona College food truck is now open for business. We went around campus to get student reactions to the new dining option. Students, faculty, and staff gathered on the quad to commemorate Iona's veterans who lost their lives while serving our country. And stay tuned for your IC Gale Sports Report with Ian Sachs and Entertainment News with Cassie Lina. All this and more in this episode of Inside Iona. On Tuesday, November 18th, there was a ribbon-cutting ceremony at the new Speech, Language, and Hearing Clinic. It's at the former elementary school building at Holy Family Church. Following the ceremony, students and faculty served as tour guides, and there were even simulated treatment sessions. Through expanding and relocating the Speech, Language, Hearing Clinic to Holy Family, where we stand today, in this former elementary school building, Iona was given the fortunate opportunity to strengthen and build upon our relationship with Holy Family. This is also an opportunity for us to serve the community. Certainly a wonderful training environment, and I encourage you to tour the facility today. And I have a deep personal, deep personal appreciation for those services, as I've shared with you, our Iona community, that I was the beneficiary of such services as a child. And the speech language services I received, without question, changed my life and changed my destination. Dr. Gerald Sue, a professor at Columbia University, presented his research on microaggressions and how they influence everyday life on November 6th in the Murphy Auditorium. Dr. Sue is the author of numerous journal articles, chapters, and books. His talk was part of the annual Week of the Peacemaker. This year's theme was Poverty, Power, Privilege, Seeking Peace, Justice, and Equality. Dr. Sue explains what microaggressions are. Microaggressions are the everyday slights and dignities, insults and, and put-downs that uh, socially marginalized groups, uh, whether they be people of color, women, LGBTQ individuals, experience in their day-to-day -day interactions with well-intentioned individuals who are unaware that they are sending uh, microaggressions. Microaggressions have maximal impact on the psychological well-being of the uh, individuals receiving them. And our studies indicate that they create uh, disparities in education, uh, health care, and employment. Uh, and this occurs uh, outside the level of awareness of most of our society, and that's what makes it so difficult to change. What's your story? The Department of Speech Communication Studies and the Office of International Student Engagement held its fourth annual Story Slam in the La Penta End Zone on November 5th. Students shared stories about themselves, transformational, inspirational, and heartbreaking. Uh, I thought this Story Slam was amazing. Uh, I've been to about two or three of the last Story Slams, and uh, I think this was definitely the best. People really opened up about their lives, whether it be here at school or at home, and I think it was a good preaching period between getting to know them for how you see them inside these four walls of school and actually what they're feeling outside of here and how that's changed over the years. What the Story Slam means to me is seeing the culmination of everything that I try to teach in our communication courses, which is the ability to use language to connect with other people in these very powerful ways. And we know that storytelling is the single best way to connect with other people. In fact, it, it 
creates synchronicity between brain waves. We know that when we listen to stories with a dramatic arc, we, um, the listeners release uh, and synchronize oxytocin, which is compassion. And so when we have our listeners sitting uh, and, and responding to the storytellers, that's, it's like a virtual flight simulator. Um, they are as close to telepathy as we can get. Um, they're standing in somebody else's shoes, even if it may be a complete stranger, they're really listening to this, these different stories which are so unique to each of the students. Um, and so when I watch the students who are listening and I watch the students who are telling the stories, I'm so, I'm so moved and I'm so proud of our students. For all you poets out there, it was announced that next semester, instead of a story slam, there will be the first poetry slam. Dr. Jeannie Zeno, professor of political science and international studies, is a political contributor on Al Jazeera America for the midterm election season. She first appeared on the network when the news channel premiered in August last year. As a political contributor, Dr. Zeno has been on the network's morning and evening newscasts, discussing a variety of issues, from voter turnout and ballot initiatives to the state of the economy and the impact of negative advertising. As a pundit, Dr. Zeno has also appeared on NBC, CBS, and CNN, among others. I had started working in the media, as I mentioned, in, uh, in New York in 2002. And um, it's a small world, it's an intimate world, and producers and bookers, who are the people who place you at networks, come and go to various networks. And so, you know, it was really through a process of meeting people. And in the case of Al Jazeera, um, one of, uh, a, a very good friend of mine became a producer there, and I had worked with him at two other stations. And so he initially started booking me there, and then I got to know other people there. And they also hired some of my friends from Fox, some of my friends from um, a, a station called RNN in Westchester, um, and from elsewhere. And so it was really just a process of getting to know people. And, you know, in the media, of course, it also has to do with being available and being willing to be up very, very early and stay up very, very late and um, talk about things at the last minute without, without a lot of notice. Also, of course, there's a world perspective at Al Jazeera you don't get at other American networks. So as much as the focus is on the United States, they really do look at the United States through the lens of you know, people from all over the world. And to me, that's incredibly interesting. So it, you know, it, it really does offer um, a different view. You know, Having been, CBS does amazing work and they have amazing people. Um, but they have a, you know, a much more Americanized take on, on, on you know, approaching the elections, for instance, and approaching politics. Trim it, shape it, but don't shave it. Every year in November, men and sometimes women participate in a month-long event known as No Shave November. It's to raise cancer awareness. Cancer patients typically lose their hair. ICTV reporter David Giacomino asked students their thoughts on letting their hair grow wild and free. David Giacomino here reporting for Inside Iona. I'm here on campus getting students' opinions on No Shave November. Students here love it because it raises money for cancer awareness. People who go all November not shaving to raise money for the cancer awareness. Uh, November is famous for you know, No Shave November. What's your take on it? Are you for it or against it? Uh, I'm for it. You know, anything that uh, you know, supports, uh, supports cancer and raises awareness I think is a, you know, a very beneficial thing. Uh, Obviously, it doesn't make everyone the best looking around here, but <laughs> not talking about myself, but uh, <laughs> um, no, I think it's a good thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm from Germany and we don't really have No Shave November in Germany, but um, I think No Shave November is great when you have the beard for it. So um, when you have a great beard growing, so I think No Shave November is definitely a, a fun activity and I think everyone should do it. Um, I think the scrub look can be pretty sexy at times. Yeah, so you're, you're for it. Yeah, on some people, on some people. As you can see, Iona Gales love their beards. Now back to you guys in the studio. Iona College commemorated Veterans Day on November 10th on the campus quad. Students, faculty, and staff gathered to honor Iona veterans who made the supreme sacrifice during World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. The veterans were remembered in prayer with a wreath laying ceremony and reading of their names. ICTV reporter Matt Ricker has more. This is Warren, the president of the students from the Biden Veterans Club here at Iona. Warren, how did it go to? Uh, it was a great day. The weather was beautiful, and it was a great way to come together and honor veterans and everyone who served this country. It's also the Marines. It was a great night for birthday today, so everyone well. Now let's turn it over to Ian Sachs for your IC Gale Sports Report. Thanks, Chrissy. 
College basketball season is underway. The Iona College men's basketball team opened its season on November 14th with a 78-73 win over Cleveland State. The Gales saw their 20-point lead evaporate in the second half as the Vikings took the lead 71-70 with four minutes to go. In his first collegiate game, freshman guard Shadrach Kashmir netted a three-pointer with two minutes and 27 seconds left to put Iona back on top. Kashmir was named MAC Rookie of the Week. Our Robert Bunkardo was there with more. Robert? Rob Bunkardo here at the Heinz Athletic Center, where the Iona men's basketball team beat Cleveland State 78-73 to in front of a raucous crowd. The game shouldn't have been so close, as the Gales found themselves up by 20 points, but watch as that lead slowly diminished. 20 to 25 minutes we played well, 15 or more minutes we played poorly. First game of the year, we know it's a starting point. For us, it gave us a chance to see what some of our guys are about. Like you guys, it's going to be our first look at them in a real game and see who could do what, who couldn't, who could follow instructions, who couldn't, and we have to grow from a team as from there. On a positive note, the Gales had four players scoring double digits. Isaiah Williams led the team and hit a big layup with 44 seconds left to put the icing on the cake for the Gales' victory. I was trying to just make the best plays for my team. So if I felt, I felt if I had an opening, I could just take the shot. The Gales picked up their first win of the season. Next game up for the Gales is Tuesday, November 18th versus Wofford at 7 a.m. You can see this game on ESPN. For ICTV Sports, I'm Robert Boncardo. Thanks, Robert. The Maroon and Gold followed this game up with a 7 a.m. showdown with the Wofford Terriers on November 18th as part of ESPN's 24-hour college basketball tip-off marathon. Iona lost 86-73. The Gales held a three-point edge at halftime but were outscored by 16 in the second half. Iona was held seven minutes without making a field goal. Senior forward David Lowry posted a game-high 23 points, and junior guard A.J. English compiled 22 points. Meanwhile, the women's basketball team kicked off its season with a 72-51 win at Fordham on November 14th. The Gales raced out to a 33-11 lead in the first 11 minutes of the game. Senior guard D'Amica Martinez moved up to ninth all-time on the max scoring list with 27 points and 7 rebounds. Junior forward Joy Adams posted a double-double with 23 points and 12 boards. Two days later, the Maroon and Gold fell to Sacred Heart 82-80 in Iona's home opener. Martinez poured in 37 points on her way to becoming the program's all-time leading scorer with 1,930 career points. For her performance, she earned the MAC Player of the Week award. Adams, meanwhile, compiled her 1,000th career point and finished the game with 16 points and 12 boards. ICTV's Robert Baez was there with more. Robert? The Iona Gales women's basketball team suffered their first loss in this young season in a two-point heartbreaker against Sacred Heart. In the Iona women's basketball team's home opener, they put in a valiant effort as Demika Martinez scored a game-high 37 points and became Iona's all-time leading scorer. Joy Adams also put in a great performance in which she recorded a double-double and scored her 1,000th career point. Even with all this, Iona lost in a two-point nail-biter. It's been like that since the summertime. We have three good days and then seven bad days, so something we need to work on as a team. And the team will look to rebound from this loss as they go on their West Coast road trip. I'm Robert Baez with ICTV Sports. Thanks, Robert. As the basketball teams are just starting their seasons, the Iona cross country teams are racing through their championship season. At the NCAA Northeast Regional Championship, the women's team won the program's first regional title and secured a spot in the NCAA championship for just the second time. Junior Kate Avery won the individual crown, completing the 6K course in more than 23 seconds faster than anyone else. Fellow junior Rosie Clark 
was the runner-up and senior Tara Jamison came in sixth. The men's team, which is ranked number five in the country, came in third place behind number three Syracuse and number 19 Providence. Senior Jake Byrne won the individual title, coming in first in the 10K race. Freshman Gilbert Carui, junior Michael O'Dowd, and sophomore Kieran Clements were separated by less than one second and claimed 10th, 11th, and 12th respectively. Both teams were scheduled to compete in the NCAA National Championships on November 22nd in Terre Haute, Indiana. In other news, ICTV's Anthony Carlo has developed a beat covering the Westchester Knicks. The Knicks, an affiliate of the NBA's New York Knicks, play in the Developmental League, which is similar to the minor leagues in baseball. Here's Anthony reporting from the Westchester County Center in White Plains, New York, where the Knicks held their home opener on November 19th against the Canton Charge. Hi, I'm Anthony Carlo here at the Westchester County Center where the Westchester Knicks dropped their home opener 88 to 84 to the Canton Charge. The table was set for a satisfying Westchester win with an electric crowd present as well as NBA Commissioner Adam Silver, but the Knicks could not get it done. The Knicks had four players in double digits, including Langston Galloway and Darnell Jackson, who both had 17 apiece, but they could not stop Alex Kirk, who put up 24 tonight and proved to be the dagger in the Westchester Knicks' heart. We decided to guard him in single coverage. Uh, obviously, you would think, well, go double him. Uh, we didn't go double him tonight. Uh, at, you know, and probably I should have done that. Despite picking up the loss, the Knicks saw an igniting performance out of their center, Ben Strong, who gave them plenty of second chance opportunities with his 12 rebounds and eight points. Number eight, Ben Strong. I'm just going to go out there and work hard for the team, you know, try to take advantage of every minute I'm out there, every shot I see up. I, I think of that as like, you know, a loose ball opportunity, opportunity to get the rebound on offense or defense. So I'm just going to go out there, give it all I got, and uh, try to help the team win. The Knicks will continue their homestand Friday, November 21st, as they host Grand Rapids. Reporting from the Westchester County Center, I'm Anthony Carlo. Thanks, Anthony. With your Iona Gale Sports Report, I'm Ian Sachs. With Thanksgiving quickly approaching, we decided to ask students about their family traditions, if they're excited for a mini break from classes, and what they're thankful for for this year. This Thanksgiving, I am thankful for all the friends I've made at college and joining my sorority because I now have a bunch of girls that are always there for me, and I can talk to any of them and about everything. And I am thankful for my wonderful family, my amazing friends, and my good health. This Thanksgiving, I am lucky enough to be going to Jamaica, so I am super excited for that and the beautiful weather. Um, I'll be spending time with people I love. I'm thankful to be here. I'm thankful every day that I wake up in the morning, and I think uh, Thanksgiving gives you the opportunity to really appreciate how much we're able to have in life and uh, what opportunities are out there for us. So, very thankful for that. Now here is Cassie Lina with your entertainment news. Kim Kardashian broke the internet with her most recent photo shoot. Kardashian posed for the cover of Paper Magazine and decided to go nude during the shoot. The photos flooded social media the day of the release with all different reactions. Some viewers had a comedic approach to the photos, comparing the image to a glazed donut or replacing Kim's face with that of another celebrity like Joe and Nick Jonas decided to do. Students at Iona had their own reactions as well. Let's take a look. I really don't have like a bad or good side to an opinion, like if she wanted to do that, then that's cool. <laughs> Some things in life won't last forever, and that may very well be chocolate. Two of the leading candy making companies stated that within the next 10 years, there could be a very serious chocolate shortage. The cause may shock you as well. Increased human consumption is to blame. According to the companies, less cocoa is being produced due to crop disease and dry weather, while consumption is still increasing. Efforts are taking place to produce different cocoa crops to avoid this fate, but Iona students definitely don't want to see the end of chocolate. Oh well, that's I sad. Want my chocolate. Yeah, I think we should probably find a fix to that problem. <laughs> There's a chocolate shortage? Oh my god, that's terrible. 
And unfortunately, we have some sad news in the entertainment world. MTV reality star D.M. Brown passed away at the age of 32 after a long battle with cancer. Brown's first battle began with the disease in 2003 at age 23 when she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. She later suffered a reoccurrence in 2012. She then faced her third hurdle with colon cancer. Despite the major setbacks, the star remained optimistic but had her closest friends and family there to help her. Our thoughts are with Brown's family and friends at this time. She died in the spotlight, so I think it's like really going to draw a lot of attention to ovarian cancer and the horror that it really is and everything. I think it'll help raise awareness and help a cure to be found. That's all for Entertainment for ICTV. I'm Cassie Lina. On November 9th, the Iona College food truck opened for business. The food truck was established as a late night dining option to replace the Mirage Diner, which closed its doors on November 3rd. We went around campus to get student reactions to the new dining option. I really like the food truck. It's very convenient. Um, all the food comes out very well. They're very quick. Uh, it accepts my on and off campus money, so that's good. And with the diner closed, it's nice to have somewhere right here on um, North Avenue where we can eat. Not the biggest fan of the food truck because um, I think that when students were told that a food truck was coming to campus when the diner was closing, they thought that there was going to be basically a replacement for the diner when the food truck lacks variety that the diner had. So I think that um, improvements can be made to um, make more variety and uh, a better experience for students. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Inside Iona. As always, don't forget to like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and subscribe to our YouTube page. Thanks to the TV Studio Production class for assisting with this episode. For all of us at ICTV, I'm Kyle Byrne. And I'm Chrissy Bookie. See you next time.